Thank you so much. Come into the circle of love and justice. Come into the community of mercy, holiness, and health. Come and ye shall know peace and joy. Do we have someone lighting our chalice? Yeah. One of the biggest reasons why I keep coming back to Unitarian Universalism is the introduction to our seven principles that Unitarian Universalist congregations affirm and promote seven principles which we hold as strong values and moral guides. We live out these principles within a living tradition of wisdom and spirituality drawn from the sources as diverse as science, poetry, scripture, and personal experience. So that's why I selected these short quotes about life. The first one is by Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> life is a journey to be experienced, not a problem to be solved. And this one is by Katherine Hepburn. As one goes through life, one learns that if you don't paddle your own canoe, you don't move. <laughs> and this one is by Unknown. Sometimes, when things are falling apart, they may actually be falling into place. Mm. Nice. Thank you, Robin. When the nights are smiling, sure is like the morning spring. In the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. Bright and gay, but when Irish eyes are smiling, should sure they steal your heart away? There's a tear in your eye, and I'm wondering why, for it never should be there at all. With such power in your smile, sure a stone you'd beguile, so that never a teardrop should fall. When your sweet lilting laughter's like some fairy song And your eyes twinkle bright as can be You must laugh all the while And at other times smile for now Smile a smile for me When Irish eyes are smiling Sure it is like the morning spring In the lilt of Irish laughter Hear the angels sing when Irish hearts are happy, all the world seems bright and gay. What when Irish eyes are smiling, sure let's heal your heart away. For your smile is a part of the love in your heart, and it makes even sunshine more bright. Like the linen sweet song, crooning all the day long, comes your laughter so tender and light. For the springtime of life is the sweetest of all, and there's never a real care or regret. While our springtime is ours, throughout all of youth's hours, let us smile every chance that we get. When Irish eyes are smiling, like the morning spring, in the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, all the world seems bright and gay. But when Irish eyes are smiling, sure they steal your heart away.
that. <laughs> you ever been in a strange place, somewhere you're not familiar with, and somebody smiles at you? Mm -hmm. You know, it just makes a big difference. Uh, yep. Maybe a stranger or something who gives you a smile. Uh, I want you to join with me in our responsive reading, number 440, in your hymnal. It's one of my favorite readings because it just is a constant reminder of the struggle. The number? Number 440. It's, the title is From the Fragmented World. Now, as we read through this, I want to think about it because after we read through it, I want to give you a few moments to react to it, to see, you know, what pops out of your mind, what really, if anything at all, really grabs you, okay? We'll take a few moments to do that. Uh, so, number 440, From the Fragmented World. From the fragmented world of our everyday lives, we gather together in search of wholeness. By many cares and preoccupations, by diverse and selfish aims, are now separated from one another and divided within ourselves. Yet we know that no branch is utterly severed from the tree of life that sustains us all. We cherish our oneness with those around us and the countless generations that have gone before us. We would hold fast to all good we inherit, even if even as we leave behind us the outworn and the false. We will escape from bondage to the ideas of our own day and from the delusions of our own fancy. Let us labor in hope for the dawning of a new day without hatred, violence, and injustice. Let us nurture the growth in our own lives of the love that has shown in our lives and the graces of men and women. situation as far as I'm concerned I see it coming and going very concerned about it I think we all have to be thank you did everyone hear that Jamie Responsive phrase because I've noticed for many years now that when people are feeling sorry for themselves, they turn inward and don't realize that there's people out there that can support them or that they can do something for somebody else. And when people are unhappy or scared, that's when they are not very nice to other people. Thank you. Any few more? more. Yeah, Ian. When I hear a major politician say that there might be bloodbath if, if um, they're not elected, uh, I think seriously of the delusions of our own fancy. Yeah, I think I 
hear what you and Andy both are saying about the fragmentation of our whole nation and then the fragmentations that we live with as individuals, the, the sorrow which is kind of a fra fragmentation. Thank you all um, for your comments about that. Thank you all about that. Um, you know, it's interesting to look up a word and find out its origins and where it came from. And I did that with fragmentation. Uh, <clears throat> it comes from a word that simply means broken. And, um, you know, there's a reference to being broken off from the branch of the tree of life. Uh, and a sense of, a loss of a sense of our oneness. You know, it talks about the loss of a sense of our oneness. And I think that's part of what we're struggling with in this country is that what is America? Who is America? What is it? It seems like now it's not one, it's at least two, if not more, and we're so polarized. But I think I like the fact, well, you think about broken brokenness, that we're all broken in some way. I don't think any human escapes this world without being broken in some way. And um, in, in the healing, how important it is to how we heal that brokenness. And I think Robin put her finger on it that we, we can heal that brokenness, uh, I think, both by being in solitude with ourselves, but also finding community that we find. I think Jeannie expressed that very well, that the sense of uh, healing that she feels in community. Uh, but we talk about, let Jim have something also. Uh, I remember a time when friends could uh, argue about politics and remain friends. Uh, today, the divide is so deep that uh, that conversation often breaks up friendships. Barbara has something in the back. There's one statement in here that, that, that really spoke to me. And that's, we cherish our oneness with those around us and the countless generations that have gone before us. For some reason or other, that just brings great comfort. And in spite of the politics and the wars and the dissension all around, we're still all together, part of each other. Okay, thank you. Um, we talk about you know broken, broken, broken hearted, broken hearts, uh, broken promises, broken dreams. Uh, all the other word uh, comes from uh, shattering that you know, we all experience in our lives, some kind of shattering. And and I think that the important thing in all that to me is how we how we heal from that, uh, how we heal from our brokenness. And the process and uh, the way to do that, which brings me, you know, the other uh, the other word in there is wholeness, and I mean that's a very kind of complex word. I mean, what does it mean to be whole? What does that feel like to feel that we're whole? Um, and you know, that's something to to, to uh, speculate about. Which brings me to that myth that if you read in uh, the newsletter, you get from Don. Uh, today's sermon based on uh, a little story by Carl Jung about a person, I think that ought to be it, Nick. Uh, about a, a person, you know, he says a man, I'm, I'm going to say a woman. <laughs> a woman goes away in, uh, in, on a journey to discover the truth or whatever, and she finds a cave, and she goes into the cave, and then she's there for a while. And she draws a circle on the cave wall, and for some reason that just circle just speaks to her, you know, it just clicks. Uh, and there's something inside of her that says, you know, that just feels right, a circle. And then she draws another circle, and the circles. And then she leaves the cave, and she goes out, and she teaches people about her experience. And, you know, they go, oh, that's wonderful. So they find this cave that she, she was in, and they find the circles on the wall. And they say, well, this is it. And they draw the circles. And then Carl Jung said, you know, the, the problem with that is that, you know, they're, they're anticipating the results, hoping that the process 
that led to the results will repeat itself. So what's that analogy about is the importance of process, the importance of process to fund this uh, for Herb's circle. And you know, if, if you know anything about Carl Hume and others, not just him, but the circle was the perfect symbol of wholeness. Uh, and there's a lot you can unpack about that, the circle being a symbol of wholeness. You know, Plato said this, the soul, the human soul is a sphere around. So I mean it's a it's a good uh, analogy to talk about wholeness. But I would say, well, you know, maybe you'd go in that, you'd go in your own cave and you might draw something different. Um, the outcome may be different for you. So, um, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about process. Uh, that we live our lives, I think, between being and becoming. You know, the Greeks were in search of being. The ancient Greeks were in search of being. What they meant by that was what part of you, the essence of you, that will never change. No matter what happens to you on the outside, there's an essence of you that will never change. You're always going to be you. Um, and sometimes other people see that you and us better than we see it ourselves. But that's what the Greeks meant by being, that this, this, this essence that will never undergo change from whatever happens in the environment. But then there's the becoming, which is the change that occurs, the being and the becoming. So we learn our lives between the being and the becoming. But it was uh, this uh, philosopher, Goddard Ephraim Lessing, who once said, the search for truth was more important than the truth itself. And of course, a lot of people uh, didn't like him saying that, you know, because they said, well, no, the truth is important. But he was saying, well, yes, the truth is important, but it's not as important as a search for it. <laughs> Again, the process, the circle was good, but what led to that circle was just as important for this person to go into this cave, to go into the solitude, that whole process of going into solitude and um, <coughs> having that answer given to you. Um, in our bathroom at home, right above the sink, uh, my wife put this quote from Carl Sagan, and every time I'm brushing my teeth, I'll, well not every time, but I read it, and here's what he said, uh, Carl Sandberg said, it's necessary now and then for a man or, I'm going to add woman, man or woman, to go away by himself, herself, and experience loneliness. Well, I prefer the word aloneness. I don't, loneliness and aloneness are two different things. When you think about the word alone, it means all one. It comes from all one. <clears throat> so, to go experience aloneness. Uh, to sit on a rock uh, in the forest and to ask himself or herself, who am I? Where have I been and where am I going? Now, believe it or not, and I, I, I sat on that same rock, I think it's pretty much the same rock that Carl Sandberg sat on, because if you hike up behind Connemara, <coughs> you go up this trail, he's at the top of a mountain, and there's a rock, y'all ever been to it? In Henderson? Mm -hmm. And there's a plaque that says, he sat right here. Well, in, in, in one of the darkest times of my life, in 1980, when I was severely depressed and suicidal, I walked up to that trail and I sat on that very rock. And I sat there and sat there and sat there and a voice said to me, music will save you. Mm -hmm. That was my circle. Mm -hmm. Music will save you. Mm -hmm. and, and I just felt this, this flush of just I wouldn't say joy, but just kind of like just salvation, you know. That, uh, and I, you know, I don't know about you, but I have some love music. I mean, I listen to Mozart all the time. And I can't tell you what it is about that music that has that effect on me. I don't know what it is. I can't, I can't describe it. 
what that does, what music does. And there's a, one song by Mozart, I just listen to it all the time. I listen to it about five times all the way down here, and <laughs> I just push replay because it just does something to me that lifts me out of that whole political stuff that's going on. Not that I want to escape from that, but I do from time to time. But to get back in it, you know, to, to be able to get back in it. Um, <clears throat> but the problem with, you know, the, this whole thing about the truth, find, having the truth without the process leading to it is that what often happens is that I would say to you, you know, unless you draw circles, you're going to hell. You know, or unless you draw circles just like this, you're, you're lost. You know? Or unless you say this or do this, uh, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to go to heaven. And that's been the problem throughout history with all religions, and it's particularly a problem in Christianity. And the and only reason I use examples from Christianity is because I know that religion so well, and I taught it the Bible for 10 years at the college. And Jesus said to people, you say to me this, you say to me, Lord, Lord, you call me Christ, you call me Jesus, but your heart is far from me. So again, it's like you're just mouthing off, you're just drawing circles, and you're saying, I'm there because I draw circles, you know? But the process is important. How did you get there? And the process, the way, in fact, Buddha and Jesus, well, I'd say all call their teachings a way, not it, but the way. A way to it, uh, not it. Um, and so that's been a problem throughout time. Uh, Carl Jung in his book, The Modern Man in Search of a Soul, says the most popular book in the 1400s was The Imitation of Christ. Anybody heard of that? The Imitation of Christ, uh, 1400s by Thomas Kempis. Uh, just imitate Jesus is what the book basically said. Just imitate without any, without any thought. Or just imitate it. You know, it's, it's like go through the motions and you're there. You know? I had a friend in high school, <laughs> believe it or not, was, uh, he was determined to teach his parent, his parent how to say the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, who bear, we repeat. Uh, I don't know how, he, how far he got because I just, I was at his house one day and he was getting his parrot to parrot. You know what I mean? Parrot the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Just to say it. You know, just to be able to say it. The pair, we use that word parroting, you know. We just parrot something. We copy it. We imitate it. But there's no depth of feeling with it, you know. It's just, it's just totally empty. Uh, this line from Hamlet's Shakespeare's Hamlet. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Mm -hmm. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. So just um, saying these things. Carl Jung said in that same book something that really turned my life around. And this was... Uh, not long after my bout with uh, depression. He said in that book, uh, it's no easy matter to live a life that is modeled on Christ, but it's unspeakably harder to live one's own life as truly as he lived his. Mm -hmm. It's no easy matter to live a life that is modeled on Christ. That's just the imitation, just the modeling. But it's unspeakably harder to live one's own life that, as truly as Christ lived his. To live one's own life. That's hard. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to hear people say, well, what would Jesus do? And I'm going to say to me, well, what would you do <laughs> if you were living from your own inner core, your own, your own inner self, your own, your own wholeness? Uh, and I know that's easy to say, but uh, maybe hard to do. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, we don't live at the center, we live from it. We live from it. And I really believe that that core of our being is the whole wellness of life. 
that the, that the answer lies within us. And uh, there's, there's a healing power within all of us if we can somehow awaken and reach that inner power uh, to awaken it. And to get through this, this political mess we're in today, I think we, we have the power to heal that. You know, people say, well, people on both sides say the American dream is a nightmare. You know, the liberal side says it's a nightmare, and the white is a nightmare. Uh, it's not a nightmare unless we make it a nightmare. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can go back to somebody like Martin Luther King who says, I have a dream. And it's going to take the efforts of everyone to make that dream come true. So instead of saying we're living in a nightmare, say no, we're living in a dream. We can make it come true. The future is not some place we're going. The future is a place we're building. The future is a place that we're building. We're not just going there, you know. Um, I like what Mark Twain says. Mark Twain says in religion and politics, people people's beliefs are and convictions are, in almost every case, gotten at second hand and without examination, and from authorities who have not themselves examined the question at hand, from other non-examiners <laughs> whose opinions about them were not worth a brass farth farthing. Uh, so, Jesus says, hand it down from generation to generation. Don't examine it, just accept it. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about Unitarian Universalists. They like to examine. <laughs> They like, to, they like to probe. They like to know what, what's the process that led to the Apostles' Creed? What's the process that led to the Nicene Creed? You know? What's the process that led to the word worship or sacred? I remember back in Brevard, we had this, this debate about the word sacred. And I was going, oh man, it's the Unitarian Universe was always having these controversies. <laughs> then I realized, we need to be doing that, you know. We need to be doing that. Uh, Joseph Campbell said uh, the problem is they uh, the problem with a lot of us human is that we eat the menu we eat the menu we go in the restaurant we look at the menu there's a hamburger on it <laughs> we eat it <laughs> instead of thinking okay this this is really a reference to something you know I don't eat this uh I eat what this is referring to, but I don't eat this, you know. Uh, there's the, you know, the Buddhist finger pointing to the moon, if you all know that. You know, the finger's pointing to the moon, and the, the people are grabbing the finger. This is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. And Buddha says, wait a minute. It's pointing. Oh, well, what is it pointing to? No, it's not the finger. It's the finger is pointing. It's a reference. Just like the menu, it's a reference. Just like the teachings of Buddha and Jesus, they're all references. They're pointing to something. You know. Um, the cave you fear holds the treasure you seek. The cave you fear holds the treasure you seek. But it's no fun going into those dark places. It's no fun. But yet, in that dark place is your treasure. You know, the Greeks had a word, daemon. Unfortunately, uh, some Christian fathers turn that word daemon into demon. Your demon. Not your demon. Your daemon. The Buddhists call it your diamond. Your diamond. And you know as well as I do, diamonds are formed in the darkest places in the earth. The coal and the pressure. And the diamonds are formed. Well, you are a diamond. And your diamond will be formed in those dark places. I love the analogy of the pearl, you know, how the pearl is formed. The little bit of grit gets into the oyster shell, 
and the oyster just rubs it and rubs it and rubs it and rubs it and rubs it, and rubs it <laughs> until it, all the rough places are gone and, the, and then the pearl is formed. And I, but that's a great analogy to life, you know. We won't run away from all of this, rather to embrace it and mull over it, sit with it, turn it over and over and over until finally that, that healing word comes, you know, that healing um, someone in Henderson in Bavard, this some organization asked me if I would write an article on joy, and I said, "Yeah, I'll write an article on joy." And you know what I what I want to say is that joy is not the opposite of sorrow. There can be no joy in life if there's no sorrow in life, <laughs> and this whole this whole notion of opposites. If, of what we in the West live with, you know, it's either good or it's bad, or it's good, it's evil, joy is good, and sorrow is bad. Uh, think about the Taoist, you know, where these, the dark and the light, are complementary to each other. That life moves back and forth from from happiness to joy, grief, and sorrow. I mean, it's it. Some days are diamonds and some days are stone, and that's just it. And I think every time we sing that song, Keep on the Sunny Side, we need to sing Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. <laughs> Life is done, you know, nothing but sunshine creates a desert. <laughs> we need a little rain every now and then. And we really don't need to go looking for it. <laughs> it comes, doesn't it? Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap it up because... Let me give you a, one more pearl that comes in the way of a quote. There, you know, uh, Robin, Robin read some quotes. Sometimes quotes are, you know, they can be the answer you need to hear. But this is a quote from Maya Angelou, uh, who at age eight, you all probably know, was raped by her mother's boyfriend. And then she told that he had raped her and her uncles killed him. And so she was mute for a long time because she said her voice caused his death, so she didn't speak. But you all know that she grew out of that. She overcame that, but she said this, uh, you will face many defeats in your life, but never let yourself be defeated. To me, that's a pearl. You know, that didn't come out of, she just didn't go buy a pearl. She just go draw a circle. She lived that. She lived through that, and from that came that. And again, I think we all have that within us to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid if you're going into a cave, um, going alone by yourself in solitude. Um, Mary Sarton. Um, let me see if I can find that quote. And um, Mary Sarton related how the words of a sermon made such an impact on her at an early age when it was a Unitarian Universalist minister. And he said, go into the inner chamber of your soul and shut the door. So that's, you know, that's a choice of going into a place that's going to be dark and just shut the door. And I, would, I want to add to that and hang a sign on the outside that says soul under construction. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Buddha and Jesus, Lao Tse, Mohammed, you know, they all went into the wilderness um, to that place of solitude and Come, came to terms with their lives. And I love that one image of Buddha under the bow tree when sh the demon is shooting arrows at him, all the arrows of life that are shot at us, you know. And what does Buddha do? With his mind, he transforms them into flowers. <laughs> Transformation of all the arrows that are shot at us all day long by everything. You know, the, the, the capacity with your conscious mind to be able to sort of turn those into flowers. 
my wife is taking classes in Tai Chi, you know, and just take that energy. That's the take that energy and instead of just you know, you just kind of take it and move it. Mm -hmm. at you. Somebody's chi is coming at you. You know, take it like that, move it. Um, okay. Uh, but life, life, life never stands still. Uh, we, we, we are beings, but we are we're human beings, but we're also human becomings. And part of that becoming is entering into that those times and embracing those times. There is no joy without sorrow, no sorrow without joy. Um, but going into that cave and finding that healing word, hearing that healing word. Um, that's what life is all about. The cave you fear holds the treasure you seek. Thank you. Now we're going to sing another Irish song, Ram Rambles of Spring. springtime song and an Irish song together to pick two for one. <laughs> <laughs>
and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. In grad school, my professor kept saying, trust the process, trust the process. Mm -hmm. and then I thought he was talking about the step-by-step -step procedures to do this or that or the other thing. Mm -hmm. Now I look back and I think, really, the process is life. Trust life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. I think it's wonderful uh, how much you got out of the word process. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, halfway through your sermon, I wanted to sing Where Have All the Flowers Gone? <laughs> because you brought that to mind. Thank you. Where have all the flowers gone? That's a good one. You know, I think we have, this nation has been through some dark, dark times, and I believe we'll make it. I really believe we'll make it. It's not going to be easy, but I believe we'll make it. Uh, I mean, I, we have to have that hope, don't we, that we can make it through this and come out on the better side of it. Anyway, thank you all for listening, and we're going to play some more Irish music. Like Becky said, you can sit and enjoy it, sing along, or you can go over there and, as she said, party. <laughs> Party down. Got some, got some music close here. Life is short. Safe travels home.